Oh, thank you so much for joining me today. You're joining from Chennai. Mm -hmm. I am. It's good to meet you, sister. <laughs> Likewise. Lovely to meet you. So I'm very curious how you're going to take this first opening question, especially as a kind of self-confessed recovering psychologist. Psychologist. But it's, <laughs> but it's the question that I open with, and it's what do you imagine or sense is going on in the global human psyche if we play with that frame at this moment in time? Hmm. The global human psyche. Well, here's a story. I think um, that we emerge within architecture. We emerge within systems. We emerge within relationships. The psyche does not predate relationships. Um, um, what we are is a becoming. And a becoming is a becoming with, right? So we, we are deeply relational, processual, viscous tensions and intensities in their becoming different in the world. So um, um, I think for, for a time, we've been sustained by the nature, the creativity of the city and of mm -hmm. the nation state and of the idea of the citizen and of modernity. That has been the handle, the infrastructure of um, the psyche. It's how we understand ourselves as dissociated and separated from another realm that we often think of as um, mute and deaf and unintelligent. And that has sustained the, the largely, you know, this is what I this is what I think of as white stability. And white stability isn't white people. It's it's just the the architecture of of racialized presence, and how bodies are manufactured, and how the psyche is manufactured. But white stability is dying, or to put it more um, precisely, as poetically precise as as I can get, <laughs> white stability seems to be hollowing out. Mm -hmm. That is the the anchorage, the the architecture that frames, manufactures, sustains and reinforces subjectivity as isolated, independent and um, amenable to ideas of mastery, you know, and control. That seems to be falling away haunted as it is by syncopating forces, by the interruption of the trickster, by the world <laughs> refusing to be put in the family way. It's like the world has a hidden career of its own, <laughs> right? And it no longer, not that it has ever done this, but it seems a little bit more difficult for us to pack it all in. <laughs> you know, the spillages that are happening right now, you know, we're trying to put them back together. We're trying to put climate back together. We're trying to put grief back in its box. We're trying to put, you know, spilling emotions back into the privacy of the citizen. And yet spillage continues to happen. And so that is one story I tell. It's like we're being carried away. And it reinforces, you know, it evokes those memories and images of the transatlantic slave trade, bodies carried away. This is some kind of embarkation. That's my story, the story of embarkation. Well, there's so many places I want to go with that. Um, mm -hmm. So fugitiv fugitivity is one, but there's another that you mentioned, which I'd like to maybe jump to now. Uh, which is around the trickster, seeing as you've raised that quality. Uh, and one of the ways that you've described yourself is as a self-styled trans-public intellectual. And I love that yes. figuring. Um, and you write in, in your writings that this is a concept that was imagined together with and inspired by shamanic priesthood of the Yoruba healer trickster. Yes. I'd love to ask you, what, what is that to you? And how does this permeate your becoming? Hmm. Um, just to be clear, wh what is the trickster or what is, um, I want to know exactly what you want me to dance with. 
What, is it the... Uh... Yeah, please. Maybe let's 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 talk to both, but perhaps separately, if that feels more more generative. So the trickster quality, which I love as a uh -huh. as an idea, and then the Yoruba healer. Yes, because you're talking about this embarkation, this fugitivity, this kind of yes. the ineffable, the the in ordinary states of mind, imperceptible realities, and there's something around that Yoruba healer trickster. Yes, I'd love to hear more. Yes. <laughs> um. There are stories that I often tell and I keep on repeating because I feel it's worth repeating. Some things are worth repeating. Um, the story of the trickster issue, um, stealing away into the slave ships and embarking upon this voyage across the Atlantic Ocean along with the slaves that were captured. And something about that story just reminds me or speaks to me, whispers to me, that in times of embarkation, the trickster is the, is the archetype of note, of uh, prestige. Um, there's something prestigious about the trickster because the trickster is the agent of fluid transformations. The, the, the trickster is present and simultaneously absent in moments of transition, hmm. in moments when um, the integrity of the former can no longer contain or host or be hospitable to our ideations and practices and rituals of homemaking, hmm. right? So it's at that moment that the trickster shows up. And the trickster is, of course, the anthropophized, uh, anthropophized. Um, I'm not even sure how that word goes. Um, <laughs> anthropomorphized. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's just an unwieldy word. It's so unwieldy. Anthropomorphized. That's it. Um, uh, you know, story or mm. figuration of emergence and the open-ended quality of the world. So, of course, we need integrity. Modernity is associated with authenticity. We will need projects of homemaking. We will need some forms of stability. We would draw new boundaries and we would create exclusions by creating inclusions. Um, we would need names. We would need rituals. We would need to allocate or designate what presence means and what absence means. These are all cuts that are made in the fabric of the real. Um, however, um, we also need spillage. And this is, in some sense, the way that the world becomes or examines itself, experiments with the quality of emergence, experiments with, with itself, touches itself orgasmically, um, seeks new vistas, does something different, right? It's mm. chaos, you know, reorganizing itself to sprout new forms of being. And this is what many cultures around the world have designated as the trickster, right? The playful, they often deified figure that dances at the fences, at the edges, you know, wild enough to call us into a different kind of space, a different kind of possibility. And, and that is what issue stands for. If you can think about issue in a representational way, issue is the trickster of the Yoruba Orisha tradition and, and dances at the edges. He's the man of the crossroads, not the highway, I remind you, not the highway. The highway is straight and narrow and leads to definite spaces and pre-designated places, but issue is called the man of the crossroads because the, there's something there's something complex and non-legible about the crossroads and agential about the crossroads and um, maybe that's where we are now at a crossroads hmm. so thinking about fugitivity and non-linearity these are some of the themes that um, you speak to you've written that in order to find our way, 
we have to lose it generously and that we are being yeah. called to occupy cracks in the world where the seed of fugitivity can thrive. Quite apart from the fact, or presumably very entangled with the fact that you write and speak in a poetic way, that I experience a bit like music. It kind of, the words are there, but it points to something else. I'm curious what you mean about the cracks in the world and fugitivity and because it feels deeply related to the sense of emergence of edges of something which we can't define that we mm -hmm. can't exactly predict or grasp and yet we're invited to play with yeah in order to create a more flourishing or co-create a more flourishing future for all so i don't know where you'd like to take it but i'd love to yeah. ask you about the seed of, of fugitivity and the cracks in the world um so I think of cracks as the loss of integrity. Um, and this is interesting. I also think of cracks as, and this is not a contradiction of the first sentiment or a dismissal of the first sentiment, but I think of it as the excess of integrity, right? Hmm. So this loss is excessive, or rather the excess is a kind of loss, right? We often think of bodies as isolated, independent, sovereign, and mutually exclusive. But there's a sense in which bodies are ongoing processual matters that are have never been delinked from ecologies from hmm. what microbes are doing, from what viruses are doing, from what trauma is doing, from what memories are doing. So we are, in a sense, political, social, material, spiritual, theological, gastronomical, microbial <laughs> becomings. And, and there there isn't a way to there isn't a way to tear us apart from these becomings. Right? Um and as such, when you start to think of the body as a milieu instead of as an atomic thing within a milieu, then it's easy to notice that it's easy to conceptualize or come to terms with what I call cracks. Cracks are when bodies um, exceed their purposes, right? It's... It's when bodies do something beyond their usefulness, hmm. right? They're, and usefulness is always a relational thing. We are useful in relation to a paradigm or an imperative or some pre-designated modular beat, right? Fitting in would be useful. Um, conforming would be useful. Uh, though that's usefulness, right? But But when bodies kind of stray away, which is the idea of getting lost here, when they stray away from instrumentality, for mm -hmm. instance, the cultural, the dismissal of cultural uh, expectations performed by an autistic boy, like my mm -hmm. son, mm -hmm. who, um, you know, we had a visitor come live with us and he's uh, his family, and he had marks on his body because he has skin cancer mm. and and my son went to him and said you're gross mm. right and and you're ugly and said things that made us shrink mm. in our bodies and so uh, thankfully we had already told um um this person that our son wasn't being rude or wasn't going to be rude, but he, but he he had no filter, you know, the way that we train ourselves to be polite mm. and to keep our true feelings inside, right? And and this brother was gracious mm. and accepting, and it was such a beautiful thing to see that coming out but not being received as abuse or yeah. from a six-year-old, an autistic child. It was received instead as a passing of a wild God who has no, um, you know, who has no qualms with, with 
be ugly with the, the, the things that we shy away from and that creates a brittle kind of society where everyone is afraid. And because mm. we speak in terms of the categorical, we have anxiety about crossing thresholds. And so we just shrink in a bubble of politeness, strangled yeah. by <laughs> strangled by politeness. And he mm. just said, you're gross and you're ugly. And it was received in such a way. So, so that, that dance of receptivity to the prickly, um, and I wouldn't even say it's honesty here, because it's like he had no choice but to say it. it mm. but, but the dance between them, the call and response of the ugly, which is usually, um, you know, um, what's the word that wants to come to mind here? You know, we kind of put a shine to it. And then and we, we gloss it, it in we... new ways. Mm. Uh, what's, what's the word he said? Is that... I was just thinking we, we kind of gloss over it or we... We, we gloss um, over it. Something we like We gloss this. over it. We, we, we kind of, you know, smoothen out the prickly edges because, yeah. as I often say, the whiteness is the... Whiteness is optimized and exposure. Hmm. An exposure. Not exposure, but an exposure. It's it's like we we want to reduce a tree and its prickly um, nature and its monstrosities or some the wilds. We want to reduce it to a hologram, mm. so it's easier to digest. It's easier to represent. It's easier to teach about. We can turn it this way and that, right? It like it, it's this holographic sensibility. Let's reduce everything to a tamer version of itself. But the world isn't tame. The world isn't um, always useful. And so th this idea of spillage from usefulness is potentially decolonial, potentially emancipatory, because it therefore lends itself to other performances of being with and becoming with. I'm not sure where I was going with this. I'm just <laughs> riffing. Yeah. No, I love where you're going with this. It's um, it's interesting, isn't it? That I think one of these things about how we, how we free ourselves from the stranglehold of the glossing, polite, um, kind of cultural scripts that we engage in, and it's kind of it's meant to to keep people feeling safe or. Um, yes. feeling like we belong and actually my experience has been and again your, your example of your autistic son and this family member coming and the, the family member having a sense of well I would I would suggest like compassion wisdom and maturity there's also yes. a quality of yes. that to be able to hold this as it is yes without Absolutely. feeling offended in some sense and I think there's something around this which I, I struggle with which is the sense that my most precious relationships and interactions with people are the ones where we can really meet one another and and dance in the darker spaces without retracting, retreating, without being in this defensive stance. Mm. Um, and there's and there's something and it's interesting you're talking with the, the quality of white stability and the myths that we tell ourselves. Yes. And the thing that comes to mind also for me is, you know, thinking about things like archetypes and the wild God visiting and the different mythopoetic landscapes we can draw upon one that's very popular the yeah. idea of the hero's journey it's full of vanquishing and extraction yes. and domination yeah. and it's obviously yes. it's very male it's historically very white yes. and and it's a very interesting story and i think you were mentioning earlier about this kind of like i don't think you would use the use the word hollowing out or perhaps yes. a disintegration or an untethering that there's something yes yes and i'm wondering Something that you mentioned at the Planet Local Summit, which really captured my imagination, was the monster's journey or an, an alternative that we might call upon. Or yes. What are some of the helpful stories that might exist at the fringes um, that we can perhaps call to mind to help us navigate what are quite transformative times? Hmm. Thank you, sister. Uh... <laughs> Well, the, of course, the story of the monster is the story of of exceeded boundaries, right? It's um, the the monster exists at the um, at the edges of things, 
and we mm-hmm. use the monster as part of an aspect of our moral architectures, right? We 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 say don't go there because if <laughs> you go there, then you'll be crossing the line. It's the monster that potentizes and weaponizes the line, right? Mm. Think about the ways that we we explore in filmic cinematic explorations the idea of the line, you know, crossing the line and the monstrosities that emerge at the line. Right now, I'm making plans to go see the Godzilla, a new Godzilla movie called Godzilla <laughs> Minus One. And I was just intrigued, <laughs> intrigued. And this is, um, I haven't been paid to do like a, a bit for the movie, but I was just making plans, you know, with my wife that, oh, we have to go see this movie. <laughs> Because I'm intrigued by monsters of all kinds, yeah. you know. Um, but I was doubly intrigued to see how many Godzilla movies have existed over the years, you know, since mm. the 70s, I dare say, since the 70s, giant lizards. And they're, you know, they're really Japanese creations. And, of course, there's one of the most um, stable myth of um Godzilla specifically is that it emerged as you know as a secretion of post second world war Japan right mm. the nuclear bomb created um Godzilla right a line was crossed a mm. monstrous horrific line was crossed and it gave birth to this other monstrosity of course in americanized um visions of Godzilla and I don't know why I'm going into Godzilla, <laughs> but let's <laughs> go with it. This is where I imagined this going. <laughs> this is where we're going to. This, this is great. happens to be a conversation about Godzilla. In the Americanized versions of Godzilla, he's, he's a tamer version. Godzilla mm. is misunderstood. He's, uh, he's, just, he's just a cuddly thing. He's a pet, if only you get to understand <laughs> him. So it's one way we kind of smooth in and gloss over the edges. But the reason why I want to watch this new iteration is that Godzilla is not a pet. He's not misunderstood. He's not, he's not, you, you don't take this to a park and do therapy with this being. It's not, this is not some couch uh, figure or figurine. This monster is monstrous because it does not fit our standards of understanding. It is totally transversal. It's a crossing of some kind. And, and I'm so glad they stuck true because this is a Japanese um, film, and I'm I'm so glad they stuck true to that uh, true to that um, idea. So the monster guards the edges, and and is an agent of shape shifting, a mm-hmm. challenge to the form that we've taken, right? And this is the reason why, um, in times of shift, which is and uh, shifts are moral shifts. Uh, uh, implosions to moral architecture that lead to ethical flows. Um, the, the blood of, of morality is ethics. Hmm. And, and ethical new formulations come, but they're not able to do that except the monster spills the flesh, except the monster implodes the flesh of things. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. It's so interesting hearing you talk about um, this kind of the Japanese take or in this instance, a Japanese take on the monster and how, yes, how outside of the realms, yeah, because <laughs> they're plural, yeah. there's a plurality yeah. to it. And how, um, and I'm, I'm thinking now as you, you were saying this, and I was thinking, oh, this is such a, it's a different angle, a different perspective, or it, it comes out of a different route. And that's why it's impactful and how in my early, I guess my mid-teens actually, I had some phenomenal English literature teachers who are feminist writers themselves. And two of the authors I remember being really struck by, literally just kind of the book struck me and shifted me in a completely different space. And it's a similar quality of, it's almost like a quality of awakening of a possibility of something else. It's Angela Carter with The Bloody Chamber. um, And then more recently, Sharon Blackie reviving some of these shape-shifting feral myths of what it is to be woman one of the iterations or or expressions of this. And what's so quickening about these stories is that they, 
at least for me, speak to some wilder part, the un untamed, perhaps forgotten parts that live in the darker recesses that are just desperate to come out, that are vital, that don't want to be enclosed. And mm. you mentioned earlier about this quality of, of chaos. Yes. And, and there's kind of this, we have this, in my mind, it feels like we've fetishized order to such an extent that it strangles, saying about the strangling, it strangles the lifeblood of change, of possibility, of adaptability. Yes. And, and there's something around that. So like thinking about all of these calcified systems that now feel like they're, they're kind of shaking and splintering. Yes. And there seems to be this, this obviously it depends on, on kind of the, the, the groups that we, we choose to run with. But on the one hand, in the business world where I spend some of my time, there's this kind of doubling down on how can we fortify ourselves and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Scaffold, yes. these faltering yes. structures. And yes. on the other hand, outside of the general business world, because business again is plural, um, on the other hand, there's this kind of, this emergent space, many emergent spaces, which are constellated, different people doing different things in different spaces, but that are seeking to stay closer to the ground, to adapt, yes. to shift, to reconfigure in real time. Yes. Um, and I wonder what are some of the, what are some of the movements or changes that are giving you cause for hope that, that speak to that sense of vitality? Are there examples of new dynamic webs and structures that are emerging that, that give you mm. sort of a sense of possibility? Mm. I love that question. So beautiful, generative. <laughs> um, well, let's start from this. Um, away from Godzilla a bit. <laughs> um, and that has just inspired me to write a new essay. Uh, about Godzilla. <laughs> um, I think, you know, the ways that we think about bodies, we start from bodies and then we work our way from bodies to the world, right? For instance, when we think about making a difference, we start, a, we start from the individual and then we say, work your shit or, or do the internal work and yep. look in the mirror, you know, and do all that stuff. And then it translates into meaningful difference in the world. We, so we always centralize the individual self that needs to do the work of changing the world, right? Mm -hmm. That is one way that we look at it. Um, but but I'm, I'm quite, I'm, I'm very, very suspicious of the idea of people making change. Hmm. Not, not that I'm dismissive of it, but I'm, I'm, I'm shy. I'm very, there's some reticence here that I, I'm leaning back away from adopting it. And my creaturely sensibilities are taking me in other directions. Yeah. Right. For instance, I'm not of the opinion that bodies have wounds, right? Uh, you know, you know, we think about bodies first and then the wounds that appear on the bodies, like an injury on the bodies, mm. on, on bodies. So bodies make wounds. But I, I, I'm very attracted to the idea that wounds make bodies, that, that wounds are bodies in their materiality, that mm. wounds are the mothers of bodies, right? And I think Deleuze would have been happy with that sentiment, right? That it's the chaos it's this pre-relational, or rather, not pre-relational, but pre-representational, pre-identitarian wound that gives birth to bodies. So that we are, in a sense, it's not that we make a difference, it's that difference makes us. And our politics mm. isn't about individuals making differences. It's about attending to syncopating flows. It's, a, it's about attending to those places where the wounds are enacting um, new cartographies, new choreographies, right? So when people ask me questions about this, I'm not, I'm not leaning into people making a difference. I'm not leaning into the modular or the. I'm, 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 I'm quite, a, I'm quite attracted to the molecular, not the molar, but the molecular. I'm, I'm attracted to the minor gesture, right? Um, so one way that I think I'm very attracted to respond to that question is in terms of what I call white syncopation mm. and white syncopation for me is, is how whiteness as this imminent fabric 
of of relationships of homemaking that preserves and cryo freezes certain bodies because it wants to monumentalize them as images and because it wants to flatten and clear the wilds to make space for this dissociated self how that vocation which is a more than human vocation it has never been singularly human it's the concatenation in parliament of microbes and viruses and trees and ecologies all making space for the dissociated self that vocation is is experiencing a mass disabling event or series of events right and we're registering it through how grief is becoming a public event no longer a private mm. affair how identities are softening right like the blows of this syncopating flow is softening our notions of the identitarian right and we're feeling it in the ways that we are trying to practice other ways that go beyond the binaries we're used to male versus female you know of course another aspect of whiteness is trying to include those forces right hmm. it's trying to regather or recuperate these subversive forces by insisting in some sense and i've i think i've written to some degree about this that you can make yourself legible by insisting that people conform to your pro- to your pronouns so hmm. pronoun publishing seems to be one aspect that whiteness is is deploying to recuperate identity and stabilize it within that di- even diversity even diversity equity and inclusion seems yep. to be one way that and and I think most of us would agree and you can disagree of course but most of us would agree that it's increasingly a corporate ploy right there are many giant billion dollar industries that have diversity equity and inclusion departments mm-hmm. right and and basically are saying hey we're giving to DEI and once that starts becoming the case once once you start becoming useful then it's easier to be surveilled and once it's easier to be surveilled you're part of the furniture of the familiar <laughs> so even diversity um replaces difference a differencing within because it uses the categories of colonization to make itself known um so so there there's this tug of war and i i no really i hate that metaphor or but there's this <laughs> curdling tension this tension this intensity that is making itself known in terms of the collective experiments at the edges that have no names but people are feeling and co-participating in it at the same at, you know all at once we're grieving we don't have names for this grief that we sense for this porosity that is tearing apart the dominance of ourselves we don't have a way to to language this falling apart together and yet mm. it is happening and there is a pragmatic politics here yeah let me stop there i i I'll probably give a keynote <laughs> <laughs> no i mean i i just enjoy just following you in the flow of your thinking one thing that strikes me as you're speaking and about the recuperating is yes. that it's about this obsession in part with categorization yes and if i can name and define and delimit who what you are within the structure of usefulness utility yes yes then i can claim you somehow yes. Yes. there is something in this and then there's also something in our propensity to feel that and this is my own opinion i don't know how other other people feel about this but one aspect of what happens with hyper categorization where everything must be named and delineated yes. is that we then and it's the same thing with I, i've noticed this with with much younger friends who will how do i want to put this there's something about when you meet someone and they present themselves with the categories that they believe that they are yes where it might be and and this is not to say that one shouldn't have pronouns or shouldn't speak to no. one's trauma or neurodivergence no. i think all of these things are welcome yes 
What I struggle with is when someone says, I am, this is my name, um, I want you to call me X, Y. These are the things, and it's kind of, it's, it's almost like, um, it's like I understand these are aspects, but these are aspects and you are yes. vital and unknown even to yourself. And there's something yes. about this, I don't know, it's, this, it's, it's the reducing and naming of something which is much more, is the potentiality gets unplugged yes. and dismissed and, and ostracized. Yes. And my soul hurts for that. Like I, I kind of, there is something in, in the discovery, in the continuous discovery of meeting yes. someone and including these aspects, but not foregrounding them. So they shut all the doors to who else yes. you might be. Yes. Um, yeah. and it's quite hard to talk. Do you use language to describe this thing, which essentially is, is unreachable by language. It's kind of like yes. trying to paint a picture with lines and it's like, you're missing. Yes. Color. I don't know. There's something about that. And I think for me, at least this is where, and maybe we can speak speak to this some, somehow. This is where the the potential in gathering, in ceremony, in music, in movement, um, yes. in in losing and refinding oneself in relationship to something which is co-created. That's yes. we need more of the magic. At least this is how yes. I feel. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Mm. I love that. <laughs> I love that. So I it's it's um, I call it. Apparently, I mean, I, I think this is just, uh, I, I'm, I'm sharing a bit more about the essays I'm, I'm currently writing, um, mm. but I'm writing an essay to call to think in uppercase. And, <laughs> uh, you know, and I, it's because I learned recently about um, the major school and the minuscule, the, the, the uppercase letter letters and the lowercase and and why they're actually called uppercase and lowercase and it's because i don't know this and it's because in in, in early printing traditions the the capital letters were kept in an uppercase literally oh. <laughs> <laughs> a case above the lowercase oh. right Go figure. and the smaller letters were kept in a lowercase Literally uppercase and lowercase. Whiteness thinks in uppercase. It hmm. thinks in categories. It needs to think in categories. And, and hence, you, you see, um, some of these practices today, and the reason why I feel that the blast of this disabling blast is being recuperated in these practices um, is because... Um, I feel as the, the, there is the tendency to want to be seen. It's a politics of recognition, right? Hmm. Um, but because we don't know how to think in up in lower case, which is to think in movement, which is to recognize to some degree that every social encounter is fraught with tension and paradox, not completion, right? To think in upper case is to presume that every, our, every social encounter must fulfill the imperatives of safety, mm. must fulfill the imperatives of completion. That is, you know, there's something very uh, majoritarian and um, sovereign about the, the, the opera case. It begins every sentence, right? <laughs> and, and it's used to emphasize completion, if you will. Um, so when we meet each other, we want to, we want the other to bend the knee. You know, it, it, we insist that you, you must, you must participate in all aspects of myself. But, but the thing about that it's, is that it's also an incarceration, an incarcerating of the self, right? If you do not, if you do not mention or pronounce my name exactly the way that I prefer that it be pronounced, then there's something wrong with you and there's yeah. hate filled in your heart. It, it's, yeah. it's another grab um, that also marks the impoverishment of the social within mm. whiteness, right? Um, and I, I mean, I've told this story sometimes about, you know, being invited to a space where I was speaking with three other very popular um, poets and intellectuals. Um, and I was told 
backstage, it was a Zoom conversation hosted by a huge institute mm. backstage to put my pronouns. And I said, and this is mm. not anti-pronouns or anything. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's too boring a concept to be anti this or anti. Um, it, it's, it's too boring. It's not worth my time. Um, it, so they, they said, please put your pronouns. And I was like, um, that's not my practice. And the mm. host, which was this wonderful black woman, big um, uh, grandmother woman who was a, um, who felt like an elder, she had mm. put her pronouns and she, she remarked to herself and she said, you know what, I don't do that as well. And then she deleted, <laughs> she deleted, <laughs> she deleted what she put there. And I got to thinking now, now it's not that po pronoun publishing is bad or good. It, it's it's that you know to what extent am i do i ought to uh participate in 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 the ritual that you form it, mm -hmm. is it supposed to be a full capture of some kind or or are we just conforming because we're anxious about being rendered uh, pariahs, you know, being mm. excluded, you know, isn't belonging itself, you know, in the ways that we're framing belonging, even, isn't, isn't it becoming terribly caustic and poisonous and belittling and brittle? If belonging looks like an anxiety ridden rush into a sameness, then I don't want to be part of it. Mm. Yeah, I, I hmm. this is just a piggyback on what you're saying. <laughs> but it's it's interesting, isn't it? This kind of oh, so many places we could go with this. It's the it's the reduction into these tiny things that we foreground and that being an yes. entry point. Yes. I don't want that entry point. I'm happy to include aspects. I want people yes. to ask. Yes. I don't want to shut down conversations. Like it's like someone someone once sent me a video. So my name is is a bit tricky to pronounce sometimes. It's Nahai in English or Nahai if you say it the Farsi way. And so people sometimes will ask. And and there was a video that was sent to me by a friend who was holding up, um, it was a video about one of my books. And my name was written on the front and it was Natalie Nahai. And they said Natahali Nahali. And it was just, it was one of these things where it was just very funny. And I think there's something around holding things lightly Yes. And at the same time, and this is again where it comes down to complexity and paradox, and is that also I recognize that there are times when, because of the things that we've experienced, yes, we also want that recognition in a yeah. very meaningful way. And so, yes. say for instance, like when I went to um, Turkey many years ago, I was struck by the way in which I would be called sir as opposed to madam by various different people. Mm. And I still am not sure exactly, I didn't ask because I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to cause disruption or we yes. can talk about that yes. as another kind of protocol. But um, I was one of the only female speakers at the time and the thought crossed my mind. I wonder if this is because those in positions of quote unquote authority are typically mm. male and they're typically referred to as her. And it's, but it's one of these things where my hope is that we lean, we lean in towards these questions Yes. And these discomforts and these yes. edges, you know, to bring us yes. back to the kind of the growing edge um, or the growing depth where there's kind of layers beneath which we don't dare to venture. Yes. Um, and I'm curious about that. Like, how do we find our ways into these spaces, especially when there is a brittleness that prevents us from reaching across the divide that we've created or across that that glass that shall net you know we, we don't dare shatter it yes um yes because there is a fear that it, and it, it's a way of keeping people apart yes. in some ways like if i don't yes. dare ask someone what's your experience so let's say um sexuality might be one um and to ask someone about their love or their partner and if we don't dare ask we we miss out on what could be a, a rich encounter mm. of discovery mm. how do we find ways to that when there is so much retraction and fear and we don't want to cause harm to others, but we do want to reach out and connect in a meaningful way. Well, I think harm has to, I think in, you know, this is also part of my recent writings. I think we must begin to start to notice that even harm is a, is, is a kind of politics. That harm hmm. isn't some objective thing 
that is set in stone once and for all uh, that we're trying to avoid, right? Hmm. The way bodies show up in the world is already an invocation of a politics of harm, right? Hmm. Harm in a different context or a context may be entirely different to harm in another context. So there isn't an objective or singularly subjective notion of harm that is not already transjective, right? So the transjective is how the um, the object and the subject are relationally um, complex and they come, they emerge together, right? Mm. There isn't the object and the subject and they meet, oh, you're the object, oh, you're the subject. It's, <laughs> it's that, it's that, uh, it, it's, uh, I like to uh, often illustrate it this way, that the footprint is neither reducible to the foot or the mud, right? Mm. It's neither, it's the footprint is something in, entirely, you cannot reduce it to the foot because if you were to take away the mud, there is no footprint. If you were to take away the foot, there is no footprint. It's yeah. something else, right? And, mm. and, and that is harm. Harm is emerges from how bodies interact with each other. So there, there is also a fetishization of harm that mm. is simultaneously the fetishization of subjects or bodies that are the uh, products of those subjectivities. And so it's, it's very important to name that. But it is also true that we're dealing with very complex matters here. And mm. There isn't a stable uh, or stabilizing universalism that I would buy into at all. So there are moments when we would insist that one gets, you know, uh, one's pronunciation right or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. I have witnessed um, moments when it feels imperative to do that. Right. Hmm. But I think it's also powerful to notice that even that is a risk, you know, to, to insist on on correct pronunciation is to risk being tethered or tied or collapsed into that social encounter. Right. And is to risk becoming brittle. Right. Hmm. And just as it is the case that to risk mispronunciation is to risk abuse of some kind or misuse of some kind. So, so there are risks tethered with these practices. I am just in my own limited, vulnerable, creaturely explorations, very, very magnetized by the idea of the mispronounced, right? Not just because of its um, entanglement with black history, with a history of loss, with a history of fugitivity, with the ways that the um, some of the accounts of marinage and escape, you know, from the plantation mm -hmm. cannot be read apart from mispronunciation. If you were not willing to risk mispronunciation, there was no way you were going to leave the plantation. Hmm. I recalled, you know, Ellen and William Craft, who escaped from Macon, Georgia, a plantation there, by becoming mispronounced. She literally mm -hmm. took on the, speaking about you being named a sir, Ellen Craft, um, who was, who could pass as a white person dressed as a white man, you know, wow. and her lover, who was, a, a, of course, a slave, um, performed the role of his slave, right? And, wow. and the way they escaped the plantation was to appear as a white young man and his slave, just traveling. It should be made into a movie if it hasn't already That's been made into a movie. But they needed to be mispronounced in order to leave the plantation. Mm -hmm. So there is it. There is a gift of of being mispronounced, and and that is the tension that we are trying to elide or occlude or obscure by the fetishization of harm as the ultimate evil that one cannot, you know. Um, one cannot uh, deal with or work with, I guess. Yeah. So, but yeah, but your question really is something else. You're, what, what, how do we come into these spaces? And I think this is where the trickster teaches us stuff. I really feel that public intellectual work 
has to look like stand-up comedy <laughs> these days, right? I, I really think that 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 if you're serious, you have to be playful these times. Mm -hmm. To be serious is to be playful. You have to know how to slip in through the binaries without without creating or recreating or reinforcing the structure of the binary. You have to know how to slip in there and create room, a radically hospitable space, a spaciousness that bodies are yearning for, incarcerated in those binaries. And I think that's what I try to do. I love that. One of the things that really struck me about, in particular, uh, at the Planet Local Summit, your conversation with Ian McGilchrist oh. was... And I'm... <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that was an amazing Yes, yes, yes. yes. That, I remember that one. <laughs> And I was sat there with my partner, and um, so we met through through art school, and uh, we're very drawn to, well, this question of like, how do you play in the non-verbal? And with my work with music, it's how do you use language and music to point towards something which moves you somewhere else, which language alone can't do. I thought until that point, and then we, I was listening. We were listening to you talk, and at one point, I remember sort of we looked at each other. And we're like, this is just, this is poetry. And there's something about the ways in which, and I'm just going to follow the flow here because I'm sort of thinking mm -hmm. aloud. There's a way in which you use language that it almost disarms or it relaxes the part of the mind that's trying to make sense in a linear fashion and creates kind of like this moving landscape that you can get lost within. There's a sense of quality. And as you're talking just now about presence, I'm reminded of some of the conversations I've had the, the luck to have in, in recent weeks with people who emulate, or well not emulate, what's the word I'm looking for? Radiate, actually. There's a kind of mm. sense of presence that they bring to the conversation, where of course right. the words make a difference, but there's something about the spaciousness and the quality of attention and um, kind of the being there to hold mm. whatever arises. Hmm. which is very intriguing to me, especially when it gets mediated by technology, because it's, it's usually, in my experience, harder to experience that felt sense of being held through hmm. a screen when hmm. everything is just mediated by the physical tech that we have and all the rest of it. And so I'm curious about what it means to you to show up with that quality of presence that can encompass so much more. How do you yes. do that in, in your work? Because it, it seems to me to permeate your work, and yet you use language as one of the principal tools to communicate your cosmology, your felt sense of, you know, of the world and where we go. Is that, is that a clear question? I feel like I've it, it is, it is. And I, it's non-clarity is what's most clear for me. <laughs> I'm so it's, glad you're up for it's it. It's non-clarity is the most inviting thing. Um, and, and my <laughs> response is just as it's, a, it's, it's just as speciated as your question. Um, <laughs> that in a sense, I think I am trying to um, speak without language. I'm trying to use words without language, if that makes some sense. Right? I mean, I get a palpable sense, but maybe for people listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah let, 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 let me put it this way. Uh, I don't think of language as 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 the format of communication, hmm. uh, as the vehicle of communication. I don't, I don't think of language as the way we communicate. I, I think it's, I mean, there's such a radically animist and hmm. sensuous and, um, and um, maybe you might even say spectral, but it's, Definitely, it feels um, arachnian, like a web, like a arboreal, <laughs> like rhizomatic. There's a sense in which bodies emerge in the way that I see it, that I don't know that we can process. I don't know that we can reduce the language, right? It is, this is why I use often offensive terms and people... You know, I've, I've actually spoken with some people when I say monstrous, 
they they try to clean clean up the concept. You're like, you mean uh, complexity? Mm. I'm saying, no, I'm talking about the monster because the monster is the rejection of politeness and and linearity. Uh, and and so let, let me get let me see if I can get to the point without landing on it. Um, <laughs> that that, <laughs> that that there is a sense in which I see language as a seeking, as a gesturing, mm-hmm. as a like a plant gestures to the sun, but never quite reaches it. But mm-hmm. you can see its prayer, you know, in mm-hmm. its its taut body and its leaves, it it the flowering. It's also its most articulate gesture, you know, it's, it's the eloquence of the soil to flower into the, mm. into the sun, but it never quite reaches the sun, right? It never, it never, if you, if you shift the position of the growing seed in, in the room, it will, it will navigate its way towards there. It wants to get there, but it's wanting is its being, right? And, and, and that's the way that I see language the language isn't the thing itself language mm. is just part of how things materialize so i, I want to speak with silence often i want to speak with w- without words or i want imbued in the words that i deploy a sense that the words that you're reading or hearing right now are not you know there there there's a vacuousness or a room or a poetic negativity and a prophetic mm. quality to the words used here that I'll love you not to think about. I'll love you to mm. think beyond the words so that if I say menstrual here, don't think about only the vocation of menstruation. I would like you to think about the ways that the world bleeds or that moonlight, you know, gestates or, or, or the, I, I would like you not to be stuck on the thing itself. I would like you to travel. Um, at least this is me thinking about the practice. Hmm. But my final sense of things here in response to your question is that I am not that practice. It's not what I'm doing. I've been lying all this time. So it's not something I do like, okay, this is me trying to do this. I think again, that I'm not the one making this difference. It is difference that is deploying me in some way. Yeah. I love that. (laughs) (laughs) It's funny, isn't it? Because it's such a, it, it really is hard to articulate, but if you let yourself get into the rhythm, it's a bit like, and you've mentioned syncopation a few times. I was, I was watching last night a wonderful, so I'm living in Spain and, and there's a lot of um, syncopation in the rhythms that are used in flamenco and in, in the clapping that happens between people to create these complex yeah. beats that, that kind of mm. cross-pollinate. And they really, I don't know, just so exciting. And I find rhythm extremely invigorating anyway and so we were listening and the guy was counting the rhythm it's like one two one two three four five six mm. seven eight nine ten one and like and i was captivated by this and i repeated this thing for several several minutes and there's something around when you can't quite capture the beat but there's something in the way that it makes you feel that you get it mm. but you can't articulate it until you mm-hmm. get to the point where you're mm-hmm. really dancing mm-hmm. with it because it's in your bones you know mm-hmm. And I think there's something around what you've just described and in the way that you speak and write that feels similar to that to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is quite mesmerizing. It's almost like when you see, it's like something you capture in your peripheral vision. And when you turn to look at it, it's not there, but you you, you reckon the movement. Yes. Um, yes. Anyway, so we're coming to the end of this part of the conversation, <laughs> even though I would love to ask you many more questions. Um, and so the last two questions, the first one, and I don't know how this will connect with the rest of what we've spoken about, but when we're going through such big periods of change and reckoning with the horrors and the griefs of the world, how do you orient yourself towards life and beauty when things get really painful? Mm. I keep the gasp close. And here's what I mean by that. Um, I think my temporal or temporary and limited public, trans public intellectual career has been a gasp, just a gasp. It's an invitation to the wordlessness 
and yet the incredible eloquence of a gasp. Um, I remember as an undergrad, um, and I was quite the loner, um, hmm. I didn't have a girlfriend, I didn't really have friends. Um, my life was very Kantian, Immanuel Kant. The, I organized everything in a disciplined way. I wanted to live the good life, you see. So I had these very crazy experiments in, in what that could look like. And so I would, I would plan my day to the, to the second, hmm. right? I have a watch and I would plan, I would go to, to class at this time. And after that, I'll go to the library and I'll go to the cafeteria and I will eat for this duration of time. Hmm. And I would get back into my room. This was me, very, very noxious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I remember one time I was in a cafeteria and I was supposed to eat from 7 p.m. till 7.30. Uh, but I, there was a long line there and the line took a lot of you know, time to get to. And I was this close to getting, you know, ordering my food, but it was 7.30. So I turned away at no. that time because <laughs> that was me. That was me. Just, just, I wanted to live the perfect good life. My nickname was TMC, which was called, uh, um, which was named, so it was a private mm -hmm. Christian university and the chancellor of the university had a, um, a bespoke uh, uh, this program, a course mm. that was designed to create perfect Christian leaders for tomorrow in the mold oh. of Mandela or whatever, just create the new African leaders, you know. And so he called this course TMC, which stood for Total Man Concept. And it was oh. just a mix of philosophy and theology and all of that. The school called me TMC. Because, because I, I, I was like, it felt like I was, I was the goal to reach, which is, which is something I totally would laugh at today, <laughs> right? Like if I saw that kid, I would like, oh, please get over yourself for oh. crying out loud. But that was me. That was me. But I remember one of these moments, you see, even that isn't something to dismiss. I remember mm -hmm. one of those moments when I was walking in my Kantian choreography from <laughs> class to the my bedroom and I just I don't know how to describe this but I caught a glimpse of the magic of things of course people were around me sitting on the roadside having conversations with their boyfriends or girlfriends and I was just walking to my room with my books my heavy books that I just borrowed from the library um, and I looked up and I saw the moon and mm. I don't know I just got found a moment where I re recognized that I was this, this experimental thing at the frothing edge of an explosion that we rudely call reality that is still feathering and materializing and that I was materializing on a planet that is, is itself a teenage orgasmic exploration of reality and still moving through space time and that there wasn't anything still about this. There wasn't anything foundational that we were all touching each other in this majestic way. And I, my response was just, gah. Wow. <laughs> it was just a gasp. And I think <laughs> the gasp <laughs> has been the fumes that have fueled my explorations all this time. So beauty shows up in the gasp. It's how there's something eloquent about it. And, and also non-legible about the gasp. It's how I meet my children. It's how I worship my wife. It's how I continue to try, despite myself, you know, to live in the ambitious of trying to convene a politics for the end times. And it's how I know that I'm not all of that and that I'm quite contradictory and that, I'm, that, that I have demons of my own and it's all fine. Hmm. Beautiful. What an amazing place to pause. And so I feel like this is back to the mundane, but it's all part of the same thing. So for people who are listening and who want to find out more, and I know you've got a forthcoming book that you've been working on and I'll yes, link too, to the other fact. books. 
Two? Yes. Oh, oh, I did not know about the second. Would you like to briefly mention a little about them and where people can find you? I'll include all of this. In well, the I'm show writing notes, about the hidden career of the material and I'm exploring milk. Milk and how milk becomes curds. Hmm. And I'm using that to talk about white syncopation. Um, but I'm also exploring, um, I'm exploring, uh, with a sister, um, it's called a, a sideways. We haven't come across, come to a title yet. The first mm -hmm. one I'm writing is called an ocean of milk and, mm -hmm. and I'm exploring whiteness as this material. But the second one is, is called a sideways thinking about things. And it's, I'm going to be writing this with Erin Manning. Professor Aaron Manning. It's a small book. It's just a small exploration mm. and it is experiment of some kind. But people can learn more about this on my website um, if they visit my name, Bio Akomolafe. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so bioakomolafe.net. There's also dancingwithmountains.com, emergencenetwork.org, and scienceandnonduality.com, among others. I will link to all of this in the show notes. So thank you so much for joining me. That was. Um, a really beautiful conversation. Mm -hmm.